Well, I don't have a transition video, so you have to f forgive the rough transition. But I'm glad to see you guys this morning. It's good to have you here. You know, Dave, the weirdest thing is that you're right here and you're there, and Michelle is here. So we have uh, f uh, four people total in this building, and uh, they're doing a great job. If I move this over, Randy, is this going to mess you up? I was told it was Queen Elizabeth, by the way. One of our members told me. By the way, I don't know if we said anything about these signs. Brian may have said something, um, but we have got a few more of these signs that you can put in your yard. I'll be putting one in my yard today. It says, contact me, so I'll be putting Eric and Kristen and then you can, it's up to you, you can either put your phone number, uh, they can text you or call you, or your email. And ladies, I would suggest your email, not your phone number if it's just you. But uh, anyway, so we'll be doing that this week so we can help people that need help go to the store for them. A couple other quick things. I'm just going to throw this down here. Look out. Okay. Peggy, I got you in the front row. That's a first. And it's good to see you. Amy Sue, instead of in the back, you are right in front. It's great to have you here this morning. So don't forget, so this Thursday, we will have Lord's Supper. I will post it in the morning so that you can do it anytime Thursday or Friday. Uh, take the Lord's Supper. Uh, Randy and uh, 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 David are going to help me film that uh, after this service, and then we'll have that live or up for you on Thursday. And then I will have a live service next Sunday morning at 7 a.m., 7 a.m. You hear me? Hear me there? Good to see you. By the way, Neil is here sitting in the front row, which is very difficult since he's also streaming live this morning. But Neil, I'm glad to have you back. And uh, Dave's doing a great job leading music. Brad Pitt sitting right behind you, so make sure you greet him. And by the way, Judy Spear, you are sitting next to Brad Pitt, just so you know. And Cece, you are between Judy and Bob with Brad Pitt on the end of the aisle. So, I mean, it's really just an exciting morning here at Surfside. So today we're going to talk about why I can trust God, and I've got to set the table just a little bit for you uh, for this service. And I know it takes a minute sometimes, and if you're watching the sermon, you're like, is he going to get to the Bible at some point? So if you want to open your Bible and get a head start, you can turn. Today we're going to be doing Luke 19. This story is actually found in every one of the Gospels because it's so important. But let me give you a little background so you'll know what was going on. Um, if you remember the guy Herod who killed all the babies uh, when Jesus was born, his son took over around Jerusalem, and Herod had had the temple built. But when he had the temple built, he put up an eagle over the temple, which the Jews hated. And when his son took over, they came in, I believe it was around Passover, and some of the Jews actually took an axe to the eagle and his son wiped out 40 of them. And then on Passover, his son had a golden chair brought in, and he came into town with white clothes on and now was telling everybody that he was going to be in charge, and if they would just behave, he would do his best to reduce taxes. By the way, they allowed them to have the temple uh, so that they didn't have to worship Rome, but they said, but if you're not going to worship the Roman king, you're going to pay extra taxes. These were perfect politicians. So anyway, so, so they came in and he said, if you'll calm down, I will take care of you if you won't rebel. And then he went away for the evening. And when he went away for the evening, some of the people attacked his soldiers. And so they went in and killed over 3,000 people, including temple priests and all kind of people were killed at that time. And so if you look in the context here, that was probably happened when Jesus was a teen or maybe a little younger. And so here Jesus comes into town at 33 years of age on the same weekend that this other king had proclaimed himself king. And he actually took over for a while, was not a great king, um, Herod's son, which was uh, uh, Archelaus, I think is how you say his name. And so when Jesus came into town, it was very different. When Archelaus came into town, he was there to say, hey, listen, I'm in charge. I'm the boss. And the Jews expected Jesus to come in. And when they came in, they, they had uh, a palm fronds with them. Now, a lot of times these palm fronds and palms were used at the Feast of Booths. And so some people say, well, we missed the time. It was the Feast of Booths. But here's the truth. These were brought out whenever 
uh, uh, there was a celebration. A lot of times the Jews loved to wave the palm branches. You can imagine what it looked like when thousands of people were waving palm branches. And then as Jesus came through, they threw their coats down. They were basically taking that Roman road and making it into a comfortable road, better than any asphalt road you could ever have. And they threw everything in front of him. But instead of coming in on a horse, he came in on a donkey. So let's pick up the story today. And today I'm going to talk to you about why I can trust God. Because here's the deal. During this time, we realize how little control we have in life. The Jews knew that back then. And they thought the solution would be if we could only get a king, somebody who would kick Rome out, then everything would be okay. But God didn't give them what they wanted the way they wanted. And in life so often, we're focused on frustration or fear. But I want you to know today, there's three main reasons we're going to talk about why you can trust God according to this story. And the big question today is very simple. Have you surrendered your life to him? Are you really trusting him to be your king? Now, if you're not a Christian, that is an original surrender. We're going to talk about that at the end. But if you're a Christian, the truth is we sometimes every day have to choose, am I going to surrender again to him today? Why? Number one, because he knows my future. Because he knows my future. Now, here's the deal. A few weeks ago, we had, well, it's probably been a month ago now, we had a dinner at the church right here, right across the hall. It was packed. We were shoulder to shoulder. We were eating food out of a buffet. No one would even, anybody with wisdom would not think about that today. We had no idea that was going to be our last gathering and our Lord's Supper together before this pandemic. We had no idea. But God knew. And as you're going through this time, you need to realize that God knows. Listen to this in Luke 19, 28 to 35. After Jesus said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. You know what that means? It means it hasn't been broken in. Jesus was such an awesome savior that they could give him a colt that hadn't been broken down, broken in. And just like the wind and the waves, Jesus calmed the colt. By the way, he can do that at your house today. Do you feel like an unbroken colt? Anyway, here we go. And, And which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untie it? Say, the Lord needs it. By the way, most people think that he prepared this ahead of time. He didn't just go and steal somebody's, somebody's donkey out of their front yard. And, and so anyway, it continues. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on it, the colt, and put Jesus on it. Now think of this. The king of the universe has to borrow a donkey. In Passover, wealthy Jews would stay in or right around Jerusalem. Jews who were poor would stay outside of town. Jesus stayed outside of town. That's where uh, Lazarus was raised from the dead. By the way, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, that was when the Pharisees said, wait a second, we got to do something about this. We need to kill him and Lazarus. It's also where Mary washed his feet with her hair and Jesus said she's preparing. And of course, Judas was mad because he was all about money. Jesus was not a normal king. He was a servant king, but he wasn't who they wanted. In life so often, we wish we knew what was next. And here's the deal. The disciples had no idea. Even the night that Jesus took the Lord's Supper with them and he said, I'm going to die, they began arguing over which of them was the greatest. They were like the Muhammad Ali's of the day. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. And Jesus is like, yeah, I'm going to be going to the cross. 
All through his ministry, he talked about that he would be lifted up. And he, he went back to Old Testament prophecy. And by the way, this story is Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled. But how does this apply to me today? Because the whole purpose of Scripture is not just to read it and know the historical context. What do I do with it? Well, here's the question for us. Am I being obedient to the things I know to do? See, he didn't tell the disciples, go and do this, and then do this, and do this, and do this. He said, listen, go and get the cult, tell the guys, and, and they did one thing at a time. They didn't know what they were supposed to do tomorrow. They didn't know what they were supposed to do the next day, but Jesus had told them what to do today. Here's the deal. So often we're concerned with the future. So often we're concerned with God's grand plan for us. But the question is, am I being obedient to him today? Am I watching the shows that he would want me to watch? Am I listening to the things he'd want me to listen to? Am I speaking in love and truth or in hate and anger? The truth is we have to look and say, God, I want to do today what you've called me to do today. And many of those are easy because he gave us two commands, love God and love people. Have you spent time in prayer this week? Have you spent time in God's word this week? Have you spent time loving your family? For some of you, your family is all over you. You need a break. Well, take that break. But go out of your way for a a once-in-a-lifetime chance to bless and encourage your family, to comfort your children, to comfort your parents and grandparents, to call people, to text people, to FaceTime people, to Zoom people, to Google Hangout, I think it's called, people. Martin Luther said this, the sin underneath all of our sins is to trust the lie of the serpent, that we cannot trust the love and grace of Christ, and we have to take matters into our own hands. See, if you don't know it, in a lot of hospitals, there's a shortage of supplies. And my wife is a doctor. They're telling her, I believe some of the hospitals, it's once a day they will give you a new mask. And other hospitals, it's once a week. Something that would have gotten hospitalists and doctors and nurses fired just a few weeks ago is now seen as helpful. And so one of the things I created this week was a box with a UV light inside of it. So that when my wife comes home, she can put her mask inside of here and be able to fix it. Be able to to decontaminate the mask with, with UV light and all the reflective stuff. I'm just trying to do what I can to help. But even in that, I'm helpless because I put the whole thing together and the bulb was blown already. Sometimes in life, even when we try to control things, it doesn't go the way we think it should go. So sometimes we just have to say, God, I can't control this. And he says, this is what I want you to do today. Number two, because he knows the facts. So not only does he know the future, he knows the facts. And I'm talking about he knows the truth. He knows what's next for you. I'll never forget this Christmas. Um, uh, We had bought Jenna a, a new computer. She was begging for months for a computer for school. She needed one for school. And as she, did he actually walk in front of the camera just now? That was awesome. We have one person in church and they walked in front of the camera. That was awesome, Dave. Um, Anyway, see, even with just two people here, I'm distracted, which is nothing new. But I'd like to thank all of you. Tom, my brother-in-law is sitting out here this morning. Tom, it's good to see you this morning. Uh, Brad Pitt, I hope you're doing well. Uh, you need Jesus. Um, anyway, so, uh, and Tom Hanks, stay away from me because every movie you're in, you get lost or crash or something. So, um, anyway, and some of you are talking to Wilson at home. Anyway, so Jenna at Christmas. So she's home and and. And she, uh, um, she had told her brother, Kyle said, what do you think you're getting for Christmas? She goes, oh, I know I'm getting a computer. So my son is slightly evil. And so he called his dad and he said, hey, dad, you need to not, you need to hide Jenna's computer and not give it to her with all the other gifts because she knows she's getting a computer and she's so sure of it that she's not even going to appreciate it. So I thought, that's a good idea. So I hid her computer in the other room. And we had Christmas morning come, and everybody did their gifts. And we go around one person at a time. We open, it takes hours at our house, ungifted at a time. Everybody opening their gift. And, and oh, thank you so much. And Jenna opened all her little gifts. And we finished, and I said, okay, 
I hope you guys have a great day. And I could see on her face that look. Yes, I touch my face a lot, I'm sorry. I could see on her face that look of trying to pretend that she wasn't disappointed and yet she was. Trying to be appreciative, trying to show that she uh, uh, was appreciative for all the gifts she had gotten, and yet the one gift she knew she was gonna get, she didn't get. And so as people started to get up and started to leave, I could see that look on her face, and as she started to head up the stairs, I said, whoa, whoa, wait, I think there's one more thing. And I brought out the package, and she immediately went, oh, And as she opened it, she began to cry because she realized the whole time we had gotten her that, but she didn't know what was going to happen. Listen, you don't know what's next, and you don't know the facts about situations, but God does. Everybody has a perspective and a view. And listen to the different people in this story. So they brought the donkey to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. By the way, this fulfills a prophecy from Zechariah 9.9. Google that. And as he went along, the people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king that comes in the name of the Lord. And remember, they were throwing cloaks. They were throwing palms. They were throwing all kind of things on the ground to welcome him. And he's quoting, they're quoting from Psalms 118, which was common during Passover. And they said, peace in heavy heaven and glory in the highest. Now realize, as they're saying this, most likely Lazarus is with Jesus. People came with Jesus and said, we knew this guy was dead and he's alive and they are celebrating and they are freaking out. And remember, there's Roman soldiers there watching and they knew what happened not that many years before. And as the Roman soldiers are watching, they hear all of these disciples saying, this is our king. And they were like, what? By the way, you'll remember later what was put over the cross was here's the king of the Jews. Basically, hey, you guys called him your king. Look what we do to your king. Our God is greater than your God, but we know the end of the story on Easter. We'll talk about that next week. And then some of the Pharisees are also standing in the crowd. Remember, they wanted to kill Jesus. They wanted to kill Lazarus. And in one of the other gospel versions of this story, they said, look, everybody's going after him. We've got to take care of him. And he says, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And then Jesus called in an Old Testament passage. He said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Which, Dave, we call that the first rock music. Yeah, it wasn't that great of a joke, but it's better than the... So let me ask you this question. So within the crowd, you've got people who said Jesus is going to be king. And of course, they were thinking that meant kick Rome out. You had Pharisees who said, we've got to squish this. You've got Romans who said, wait a second, he's going to try to make himself king. And all of these people did not understand what Jesus was going to do. So let me ask you this next question. Do I listen to others more than the Bible? Do I listen to the opinions of others, what they think matters, more than I listen to God's will, more than I listen to God's word and what he says? By the way, in ourselves, we often miss it. Listen, anytime you feel like you hear God, it has to line up with his word. If it does not line up with his word, you are not hearing from God. Rick Warren says this, trusting God completely means having faith that he knows what is best for your life. You expect him to keep his promises, help you with problems, and do the impossible when necessary. Are you trusting God with the impossible? Remember, when he came, they wanted a prince of war. They wanted Jesus to come with a sword drawn. And when he came, he came on a peaceful animal. They laid down the palm fronds. In many cases, the palm fronds represented Rome. Oftentimes, Roman kings had palm fronds laid before them as a way of saying, we honor you. And yet, Jesus was not going to be who they thought he was. Are we going to listen to him or what we want? See, many of us want a savior who takes us to heaven, but we don't want to live for him today. And you can't have both. 
You can't say, I just want fire assurance at the end of my life and I want to do whatever I want. If you're going to trust him as king, you have to trust him for the king he is, not the king you want. And so many of the disciples were looking for the king they wanted. And then finally, he knows my future. He knows the facts and he knows my failures. I don't like when things don't go the way I want to. I get discouraged. It makes me want to give up. If I'm doing something and the machine breaks, there's times if I'm working on something that I just put it down and walk away. It's so discouraging to me. Why? Because I can't fix it. In life so often, have you ever looked in the mirror and thought, why did I do that? And when it came to making this box and the bulb didn't work, there was nothing I could do about it, except for one thing. I wrote the manufacturer yesterday. And when I wrote the manufacturer, the first thing that came up, and of course it's Amazon, first thing that came up was, hey, this is going to be delayed because of what's going on. So I thought it's going to be months before I hear anything, and I really would like to get something to help my wife. This morning, I got an email that said, we will be replacing and sending you a new bulb as soon as possible. There are times in life that you and I realize we don't have any control. We can't fix anything. We can't make things happen. Things break that we don't understand. It's frustrating. It's irritating. Life doesn't go the way we want it to. And sometimes we just have to say, God, I need you. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city... He wept over it and said, If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. He realized they were not looking for the Savior that he was, and many of them were going to miss God in their midst. Are you missing God in your midst because you got your eyes focused on the wrong thing? Are you focused on the hurts and the pain and the frustration and the, and the fear that you have instead of realizing all that you've been blessed with? The day will come where your enemies will build an embankment against you, encircle you, hem you in on every side, and then listen to this terrible description Jesus gives. They'll dash you to the ground, you and your children, within your walls. They won't leave one stone on another. Why? Because you didn't recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus knew all those failures. He knew that the Roman soldiers did not want him to be their king. He knew that the Pharisees and the Sadducees wanted him dead because he was messing with their political power. He knew that many would reject him and cry crucify him. And yet, listen to what he did next. Have you ever felt like a failure? Have you ever felt like you couldn't get things right? Well, there's good news for you because even on the worst day you and I could ever imagine, listen to what Jesus did. Luke 23, 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Now, this is Jesus. Remember, he could calm the storm, which means he could bring the storm. But instead of bringing the storm, what did he do? Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. My last statement today is not a question. And then he divided up his clothes by casting lots, it says. My final thought today is not a question. It's a statement. And it says this, Father, I surrender my life to you, thank you for giving, for forgiving my sins and failures. Because in life we realize when something happens, we realize how little control we have over life so often and even over ourselves, even over our passions and our desires and and sometimes we eat more than we meant to eat and sometimes we say things we wish we hadn't said and sometimes we do things we wish we hadn't done and sometimes in traffic we think things about people that we shouldn't think and we all know that we are sinners. That means we have a natural propensity, a, a, a pursuit of sin and even after we become Christians, those old habits follow us. We don't have control And we can focus on fear or frustration, but I want you to know you can trust God because he knows your future. 
because he knows the facts and he also knows your failures. By the way, he knows your failures more than you do. One of our folks just fell asleep. I feel bad for him. He knows your future and the facts and your failures. So here's the question. Have you surrendered your life to him by trusting him to be your king, the kind of king he is? I want to read from John 3.16. It's not in your notes, but many of you know it. And I want to break it down for you. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. So I want to tell you how you can give your life to Christ today. And if you've already given your life to Christ, I encourage you to pray this prayer again, just as a prayer of rededication. For God so loved the world. Father, thank you that you loved me enough. That he gave his one and only son. Thank you that you love me enough to die for me. To give your son. God, you gave your son, Jesus, for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, the Bible says. He gave his one and only son. He gave Jesus. He loved you enough to give everything. God, thank you that you gave Jesus for me. That whoever believes in him, the Bible says believes, that's the word faith. So then you pray, God, I want to put my faith in you. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Father, thank you that when I believe in your death and resurrection and I surrender my life to you, it's not just knowing about him, it's putting our faith in him. When you surrender yourself to him, the Bible says that you become a Christian. And if you want to talk about that, you can email me, you can text me, you can send me a note, and I would love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. There's a prayer we're going to put up on the screen now. I know you guys will have to go back to it. And here's what it says. Father, in the midst of uncertainty, help me to be obedient in the things I know I should do. Thank you, Lord, that you know my future. Thank you that you've given me the truth in the Bible. Lord, thank you that you've loved me and died for me, even though you knew all my failures. Today, I surrender myself and all of my will to you. In Jesus' name, amen.